So I'm here today with uh, Stuart Lynn at the Boston Data Festival. And Stuart, welcome to um, Boston. Thanks for having me here. I know you came up from Boston, so it's great to have you up here. So your title is Map Scientist at CardoDB. How yeah. the hell does one get a title <laughs> like Map Scientist? That's the first. Well, I think you have to first of all start working for a company who's um, cool enough to actually create a role right. called Map Scientist. <laughs> um, uh, but I mean, it really does reflect what our group um, does in the community and the company and part yeah. of the community team, which is really about prototyping new ideas, like trying new things out, seeing how we can really push mapping online, how far we can push it, um, and also working with like very disparate um, groups of people who may not even know that they're they're looking for mapping. Um, right. So, for example, I'm, my background is in astrophysics and. Uh, about a month ago with the New Horizons um, probe um, coming to Pluto, we made uh, a map of the, the journey from, of the, the probe from the Earth all the way out to Pluto and the stops along the way it made. And that was using our technology. It wasn't a traditional map. There was no mention of the Earth apart from a tiny little dot on the visualization. Um, but it was using the same platform and technology oh, to really so get cool. it there. So that was fun, yeah. Excellent. And um, I have to ask a question, uh, but how did you jump from uh astrophysics into becoming a, a data scientist, or should I say map scientist? Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah so I, I think actually data, map scientist, the, way, the best way to think about it is as a data right. scientist, but for maps. So it's kind of like a similar kind right. of like uh, um, path. Um, it's actually interesting, I met two other astrophysicists at this uh, conference um, already, okay. like they came up to me afterwards and just introduced themselves. So we seem to, to go from one to the other. A lot of astrophysicists do. Astrophysicists yeah, we, we cluster, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We just like find each other magnetically right. and sort of thing. Uh, but a lot of us do go into data science after um, astronomy. That, the kind of astronomy I did was um, galaxy formation studies, which require you to simulate and gather data about um, millions yeah. of uh, million, the millions and millions of galaxies that are out there. So by definition, it's a big data project. And yeah, very data driven. Yeah, and, and even if you go in with like um, romantic notions of setting a telescope all night, you quite quickly learn that you have to get good at handling large volumes of data. Right, I, I bet. Yeah, so for me, I, I kind of did a PhD with that, learned to do some data analysis, but then I quickly got involved in a project at Oxford University um, called the Zooniverse, which was a, a crowdsourcing project for big data. So we took millions of images of galaxies or millions of data plots of anything else that needed to be analyzed by people rather than computers, and we put them online and crowdsourced the analysis. Um, from there, we kind of I started working with CardoDB a bit to visualize some of that data, and eventually moved to work for the company there and uh, analyze geospatial data, which is not too different from astronomy. They're both points in a sphere, I guess, right? Very, um, very good, yeah. It's another lesson that data is everywhere. That is. Um, so when we were talking earlier, you, you mentioned a term called honest maps. Yeah. Tell us about the honest map. So maps are interesting. Maps are such a, a visceral and immediate like data visualization. You show somebody a map and they understand what they're seeing right. and they understand what they're looking at. But it means that they can be misused a lot as well. They can be very, very easily um, uh, tweaked, I guess, or, 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 or changed well, to, to play. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, um, it's obviously not, it's something that's not even intentional, but for example, yeah. today we were in the workshop, we were um, plotting some crime data in Boston, and we were looking at the aggregate data um, between different neighborhoods in Boston. But if we didn't normalize that population density or, or area or something else, then, then that right. would be a very misleading map. It would show the places are unsafe when they're not. It's just that they're larger and contain more data. And this is a problem for mapping data in general because it's, it's something very hard to find those Pro like parameters to normalize by or to, to sort of you know right. weigh by. Um, um, so I think it's really important to make honest maps and to make beautiful maps as well. That's that are visually appealing. Um, so we've tried. We really strive with CardiDB to try and. Um, make that easy to do. Um, we have a large corpus of um, public data that we have on our system that people can just grab and bring into their accounts, and that can often provide those like extra parameters to be able to normalize and help them understand the data better. Excellent, and uh, you did your talk earlier today at mm -hmm. the Boston Data Festival, and uh, it was very well received, by the way. We got lots Glad of, to hear uh, that. Um, good comments about it, and the title of your talk was uh, Real-Time Mapping from uh, Distributed Sources. Can you talk a little more about yeah, so I, I wanted to talk about, um, about how the Internet of Things is becoming more and more of a, a, a really prominent data source. Um, it's, right. it's, you know, it's obviously very distributed, it's very inhomogeneous, there's a lot of you know, um, confusion with the different variables you're getting from different pieces of data. Um, but people are beginning to build platforms that aggregate this stuff together into, into you know, nice little packets so you can search right. and, and go for it. So I wanted to show how we could use CardDB to begin to map some of that data and to really analyze it. So as a part of the workshop, we, we grabbed some uh, data from one of my favorite Internet of Things sources, which is taxis. Um, taxis are amazing like resources for information. They've oh, wow. got GPS, they pick people up, drop people off to record those things yeah. and that data is not necessarily easily available but one of my colleagues um, Christopher Wong um, made a, a freedom of um, information request for that information from New York um, 
uh, New York um, government and uh, got it. And so there's about 110 gigabytes you can download um, today of trips around New York and taxis. So we, we did, couldn't analyze all that in, right. the, in the workshop, but we, we took a much smaller subset. And even with that, you can see things like the pulse of the city, people going to work, coming home from work, um, being picked up and dropped off. And, and the cool. reasons there. Yeah, that's very awesome. And the talk is recorded, so um, people will be able to see that on the website. Definitely. Uh, go look for it on our website, opendatascience.com. So um, data is and big data. Mm -hmm. You know, um, inherently, um, it's hard to visualize. There's only so many pixel, pixels on the screen. It's hard to visualize uh, big Definitely. data. So, can you give us some insights into that? I mean, I think mapping is a really good place to look at um, for inspiration for that problem. Right. I mean, mapping itself is a data compression almost like course, yeah. uh, like act. So you're you're taking this large corpus of data, you're selecting the areas that are meaningful and interesting to you, and then we're compressing that down into PNGs or JPEGs and in a way that takes vector data through to to um, migrate data. The technology we're using to animate and map the taxis um, is an open source piece of technology from ourselves called Torque, which, is, uh, which does exactly that. It uses a backend like um, PostGIS, or we're exploring other backends just now as well, things like Redshift and Spark, um, to perform aggregations on geospatial data and to sum things over pixels within a geospatial space. And then it delivers that data to the client, um, the browser, um, and, and it's a compressed format and allows the, the browser to use things like HTML5, Canvas, or WebGL to, to render that on a slippy map. So you can do really amazing, beautiful visualizations, selecting just the data you want, aggregated in the way you want. And with the maps, obviously, of course, you can zoom. So different zoom levels can have um, pixels which are saturated, but then if you zoom in, you get more and more detail. And this is all open source, um, available on GitHub? It's all open source available on GitHub. Um, CardDB is a company where we're very aggressively open source. Pretty much everything yeah. we write is available online. You can recreate our full stack if you want um, oh, from that's, the, that's the data. So cool. um, their GitHub is just CardDB, so it's github.com slash CardDB. Yeah. How long has uh, Torque been around? Uh, Torque was, I think we kicked Torque off about three-ish years ago, but we've been steadily improving it, and we're hoping to have some more improvements relatively um, shortly. And we're opening up as a an open standard, and um, the data format that it uses for transport. There should be docu some documentation about that relatively soon, so check out our blog to, to sort of learn about that. Yeah, I haven't used Torque, but I have seen um, some examples, and it looks amazing, so um, yeah. definitely check that out. Uh, but Stuart, thank you so much for coming down, uh, or up from Boston, whichever way to say it, I still, <laughs> I still have figured it out. But um, thank you for coming up here, doing a great, great talk, and hope to see you again. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.